Hey guys, thanks so much for uh, coming today and being a part of our service. We're so excited about what's going to happen today. It's Pentecost Sunday. How great. And we're going to talk about the Spirit and the manifestation of the Spirit in our life today. It's going to be awesome. So get ready for what God is going to do in your life today. Hey, you know, one of the things, uh, images of the Spirit I really love is that He is the Comforter, that He comes alongside of us. 
Uh, there's a Greek word parakletos, that he comes alongside of us. And this is Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to talk about how the Spirit helps us in our weakness in just a bit. But one of the ways is that he comes alongside of us. And so I wonder in what way do you need the Holy Spirit to come alongside of you today in what you face? Maybe it's to empower you in a ministry he's called you to do. Maybe it's to help you through a difficulty you're facing in a time of weakness. He stands ready to come alongside of you today if you will invite him to do that. Um, can I pray with you? Can you uh, for him to do that? And can you invite the Spirit to come alongside of you in this moment in whatever you face today? God, we thank you so much for the Parakletas, the Holy Spirit. And we say, Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in your own special way. And we're thinking about that area of our life right now where we need your comfort, we need your empowerment, we need your presence in our life. And we call out to you, God, to come alongside of us. And we know that the Father will give the Spirit to those who ask him. And so we ask you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, the Father gives the Spirit to us. And um, the thing is, like, he is a giving God in that way. And, like, when we spend time with him, then it changes us as well. And we become giving people. Like, that's just part of it. Like, that, that, that God changes us. And we become like him. So we want to challenge you in your giving. God has given us the spirit. We celebrate that on Pentecost Sunday. And so we should be givers as generous as God is. So you can go over to greenwall.evangelassembly.org and, and, um, and you can designate a way over there that you can give to God today and uh, give to his work and know that others can be reached through what you give. So thanks for doing that. Um, it just shows like how, how could we possibly like receive so much from God, and not in response give back to him. It's impossible. So I challenge you today to give to him uh, in response to his great gift to you in Jesus Christ and in the giving of the Holy Spirit. God bless you guys, and thank you for your gift. Not be all else to me, say.
Hey, everybody. Hey, have you ever had a hug from someone at just the right moment of your life? You know, my grandson, Tristan, um, he gives the best running jump hugs. Like, and honestly, I can only handle being away from my grandsons uh, for a certain amount of time. And when we get back together again, man, the hug is just so amazing, right? Um, like when we met them last year in the spring in South Carolina when I picked them up at the airport, and Tristan sees me like through the glass windows of the airport where they get their luggage. He comes dashing outside, jumps in my arms. Or the hug I just got when we arrived in California just last month for a short visit. Ah, oh, traveling's a pain, you know, packing, airports flying. I don't really like it. But that hug, oh my gosh, it makes it worthwhile. Well, today I want to talk about the embrace of God and how that embrace makes it all worthwhile. How the embrace of God um, at times, especially when we feel our weakness, even more so. Romans 8 says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy uh, comparing with the glory to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for the adoption of sons as sons the redemption of our bodies for in this hope we were saved now hope that is not seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees but if we hope for what we do not see we wait for it with patience likewise the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know what we ought to pray for as we ought but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, Paul's talking about how in this life, just how things are just off. All the creation is waiting, longing for the fullness of the kingdom of God to come. The kingdom made its appearance in the coming of Jesus the first time, but it won't be in its fullness until he comes back. So we live in what's known as the presence of the future. We already get to experience some of the joys and blessings of uh, being the sons and daughters of God. But not all of them yet. We get a taste, but the full meal is yet to come. So there are ways that we still live in weakness. We still taste sickness and death and sin and struggle. And sometimes we don't even know how to pray. And in this weakness, the Spirit helps us. Now the English word helps is actually so weak here, right? The Greek word is soon antilobanomai. Try saying that yourself. Well, the last part of it means to lay hold of. It can have that idea of embrace. And the soon part means with. So the Holy Spirit takes hold of us, embraces us as we face the weaknesses of this life. Like when you face a tragedy and you feel like you can't even stand and someone else's embrace holds you up. So I want to think about the two ways the Spirit does this for us on this Pentecost Sunday. Number one, when life is too much. The Bible refers to pains in this passage. Look, in this life, Jesus said in the Gospels, we would have trials, right? In those moments, we need to lean into the embrace of God. We need to let him lay hold of us. Because, well, we need it, right? And because God rewards faith. When you and I, in the embrace of God, face weakness and uncertainty, and we obey anyway, that's showing faith. I've seen so many of you at Evangel do this. Life was hard and you leaned into Jesus and you kept coming to church. You kept worshiping. You kept serving and giving. And I see you lift your hands in worship. And I know what you're going through. And it has so blessed me. And I have watched him bless you as, in return. Um. Also, when what we ask for seems to be too much. You know, in this world, because of the fullness of the kingdom of God that has not yet come, we walk by faith and not by sight. I mean, if we could see it, it would require faith, right? Think about it. So, 
But part of the reality of living on this side of heaven means we have to live life by faith. But in reality, it's only the heart that can rightly see anyway. What is essential is actually invisible to the eye. The Bible says what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. Francis Chan said this, True faith means holding nothing back. It means putting every hope in God's fidelity to his promises. So I wonder today, are you holding back in any area of your life? What about in the area of time, talent, and treasure? You're just holding back because you're afraid. Don't. Because look, God rewards faith. And, and his rewards last. They don't fade. Look, when you and I in the embrace of God face the weakness, and the uncertainty, and we obey anyway, we bless the heart of God and we open up our life to receive his blessings in even greater ways. You know, last week we looked at the story of Elijah and the widow. Uh, we looked at that on Mother's Day. In a time of famine, the prophet actually asks her to give all she has. We read about that in 1 Kings 17. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a woman was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, and only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it. And bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. So, like, you think about it. When I read this, like, God seems to be asking too much, right? How could God ask such a thing of this woman? And we looked at this last week. Well, first off, because of God's command. Um, it, it, 1 Kings 17, 9 says, Behold, I've commanded a woman to feed you there. So, he is God after all. Secondly, because of his promise and faithfulness. Verse 14 says, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. So he's going to provide. So here comes the choice. Now this woman is faced with the most difficult choice. There was the choice of natural reason. Human natural reason says this is foolish to do this. Like, I shouldn't take the last bite of food from my starving son and give it to this man. To do such a thing would be like the height of foolishness, right? Um, she could try to stretch what she had as far as she could, right? And then, like, she would die at least with the dignity of knowing that, like, she had done her best. Or there's the choice of faith. She could give her last meal to this prophet, Right? And if he was a true prophet from God, and something in her heart was certainly telling her that he was, then her supply of food would be guaranteed and her son would certainly live. So after weighing the pros and cons, this desperate widow made the most difficult decision. Verse 15, and she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. Look, nobody said that living by faith would be easy. <laughs> if it was, everybody would do it. But this is why the blessing is so great when we trust God. When we live by faith, we see his faithful provision. Now, last week, I said that over the next 90 days, we wanted to call all of us to a generosity challenge. To give your time, talent, and treasure to God. To trust him with it. Look, if you already are, then I'm challenging you to add to that as he speaks to you, to take a step and to see what God will do. Do it in your time spent with him. Add more to it. Um, or if try a spiritual practice you've never tried before, like fasting for the first time. So take a new step in some way in your serving. Volunteer for God in, in a new way, right? Take that step of giving him your talents in some stretching way. Do it in your financial giving. Take a step, right? So if you've given a, a fixed amount occasionally, Give it regularly, right? Take that step. If you've given a, a fixed amount regularly, then take a step to give a percentage giving. Maybe start with 3% or 5%. You know, if you're doing that, then take a step to move up to what the Bible calls us to, like a tie, 10%. 
If you're doing that, then take a step even beyond it. I'm asking you to do this for 90 days, to, to generously give, volunteer, and set aside time for God. And then to watch what God will do, how he will embrace you, how he will provide for you. You know, as I've prayed about this, God specifically talked to me about this last year. As, as ministers, we are actually required to give 10% of our income to God. And he said, Brian, I want you to bump it up to 11%. Um, a 10% increase. So for 90 days, I'm going to do that and watch what God's going to do. And I'm excited because I have seen God provide in my life in the past in all of these categories. I have seen God provide for so long in my life, like when we were a young married couple. And I, I remember we had to raid our penny jar to buy groceries. But you know what we kept doing? Giving to God. And God has so provided over the years. I look back to where he brought us from, and I stand amazed at his amazing blessings in our life, and I can't wait to see what he has next. So what's he calling you to do, right? Um, if you take the step, he will bless. Look, we have people from our church that we're going to be hearing from what God did in their lives as they gave to him, and we're going to hear those stories in the next few weeks. Let's listen to one now. The more time I spend with God, the more I love other people and the more I appreciate other people. And me, I'm a pretty, unless I have been in the past, a pretty self-centered person. Mm. And so uh, um, I would say just feeling that love for other people, wanting to help other people, and just having empathy for other people. Mm -hmm. That's something I've always struggled with. The Bible says that the more you spend time with God, the more you start to become like him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, God loves people. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, can't help but love other people when you uh, spend time with God and try to align your will with his. Whatever I give God, God gives me back twofold. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, I'm, when I'm spending time with God, and when I make that a priority, I could give him 20 minutes of my day, but I feel more productive throughout that day. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel like time kind of slows down almost where I'm just like, instead of wow, where the day go, it's wow, it's only three o'clock right now. <laughs> and so it's, I would say just, just take steps and just, just say, God, I'm going to give you this time and, uh, do with it um, what you will mm -hmm. and uh, just take it as a challenge almost like challenge God, you know, almost mm -hmm. where it's just like, I'm going to give you this time. I don't have much time, but I'm going to give you some and trust that, that you'll, you'll make time for me to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to get everything done that I need to get done. You know, mm -hmm. I think as I, as I gave more time, I felt that. And as I gave more time for the right reasons mm -hmm. that, um, before, I would say it was more out of guilt mm -hmm. than out of a desire to spend time with him. Mm -hmm. But once I realized he wa he uh, he wasn't up there sighing, oh, this guy's going to talk to me again, and <laughs> realize he actually wants to t wants to spend time with me, and uh, and that made me want to spend time with him. Um, and uh, once I realized that. And I started spending time with him for the right reasons. Then I, I felt God's blessings. Mm. I think a lot of the discipleship discipleship groups and some of the ways they approach things, it just kind of uh, just kind of clicked. I think there was an image of uh, uh, Jesus sitting on your couch every morning, waiting for you to spend time with mm -hmm, him, mm -hmm. and and that that was that was powerful. Mm -hmm. That's cool. When I'm at work, I. Uh, I'll put on a devotional. Um, I'm a I'm a truck driver, as you know. So, um, <laughs> so I'll put on put on a devotional and uh, listen to that as I'm going down the road. Uh, just started a uh, um, like a read through the Bible uh, plan where uh, um, I just have it like read read to me um, in the chronological order through the Bible, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know just. It makes it so that when you're sitting in traffic, it's not frustrating. You're just like, hey, it's just some extra time with God. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
That's cool. I find a, a lot in just just the, the silence, mm. like uh, surrounding surrounding prayer. Mm. Um, like uh, you know, you have to you have to shut up long enough for for God to uh, speak to you. You know, to be able to hear Him. Yeah, yeah, and yep. you know, for for you to be able to hear it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's so if you just pray and then move on your day, move on with your day. Yes, you're talking to God, but you're not really uh, hearing anything from Him. But when you pray, you just you just quiet and still and just kind of meditate on what you prayed on. Mm -hmm. That's when God mm -hmm. will speak to you. So look, take a step and watch what God will do in your life. In, in those moments of trust and generosity, what we need to do is lean into the embrace of God. Um, and when we do, we allow him to lay hold of us. And we actually open the door for God to reward our faith, um, like he did with the widow um, in the story of Elijah. When you and I, in the embrace of God, feel the uncertainty and we give anyway, we will feel his embrace. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about gifts that God gives us. Again, he's a generous God, talents, abilities. It's one of the ways that we're asking you to give generously to God, to give back what he's given to you. Look at this uh, in 1 Corinthians. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, um, you were led. Um, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, I want you to notice that last verse particularly. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Each one of us has gifts given by God to each. Um, that means you. <laughs> we all have something, something that God has given us or God is a liar. Like, you can't say, I can't do... He has gifted you. So are we giving it back to him? Look, that gift was not given to you for you. It was given to you for others. Notice in the text, for the common good. When you withhold that gift or talent, you're robbing others. Your gifts are not yours. They were given by God to you for someone else. Look, 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 don't like, <laughs> don't bury what God gave you and rob others. And in the process, rob yourself. Kind of like the story of the talents that Jesus told, right? With the guy that buried his one talent, he didn't get any more. In fact, he lost the one he buried. There are consequences when we don't give back what God has given generously to us. We'll lose it. Look, I've been doing a lot of work recently on strength finders, and I absolutely love it. You know, and in the decades of research, they found something about all of the strengths that we have. If you don't use your strengths, they atrophy and die. They just do. So use them. Use them for God. Notice in that text again, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. That the Spirit is manifest in you as you use your gifts. That you're using gifts given to you by God. If you don't give that gift away, the Spirit won't be manifest in you in that way. That you're actually putting a limit on the ways God can show up and show off in your life when you're not generous with what he's given to you. Look, this is true not just in talents, but it's true in our time, and it's true in our talents or treasures as well. Um, there are ways God wants to embrace you, show up and show off in your life that you hold back, well, when you hold back. <laughs> you know, in my life, I, I didn't want to be a pastor. Most of you probably know that. Uh, I didn't think I had the ability to do it, to be honest with you. Uh, by the way, <laughs> this is something I learned. God knows us better than we do, right? Um, but um, that, that was something God was calling me to give to him. My vocation, to give that to him, right? I had other plans, but this is what God wanted. And as I obeyed, 
by his grace, he has blessed me. And I have been so blessed, honestly, in my spiritual life, my family life, my relationships developmentally as a person, professionally, because I obeyed and gave. Um, I, I could spend hours talking to you about the blessings that God has brought into my life. That's just how the way God works. You can't outgive him. But I've met others who have lived life with regret. Regret because they held back from God. They buried their talent or hoarded rather than shared God's blessings. Like I remember when I was a pastor in Ohio and I got to, to preach a message. I was on staff and it was a rare thing when you got to preach when you're on staff. I was so young. I was in my 20s. I don't even remember what the message was about. Actually, probably no one else who was in the room did either to this day, right? But I remember one person who came to the altar in response. God had called them uh, to do pastoral ministry too. But they had said no. And here they were, now in their middle age, looking back through tears of regret. And I was like 24 or something. And it really hit me. I saw their sorrow. I felt their anguish over a life that was not given away to God. And I pledged myself in that moment, I never wanted to have that experience. I never wanted to live my life wondering, what if, what if I had obeyed God? What if I had given to God as he called me to? What if I had used the gifts that he had given me. And it was this thought about eight years later from that very moment that made me say yes to planting evangel. I mean, that was a terrifying prospect to me. There was no money. We, we had $75 a month in pledges and $750 in the bank to live on and do church. But as I struggled with it, I decided again, I never wanted to live my life wondering what if, so we obeyed and God has so provided. And he has done so much more at Evangel in the last 28 years than I ever thought possible. Not just here, but here and around the world. And he keeps expanding it with the present vision for us as a church to be a teaching hospital, a fire starting place. That, uh, and he's doing that as we're influencing churches and leaders in our region and around the world. Like he is manifesting his spirit in ways I couldn't even imagine. And he wants to do that in your life too. If you and your weakness will take a step of faith, if you will give and draw close to him in prayer and serve and do it liberally, and you'll watch how God will embrace you and show up and show off in your life. Look, the Spirit wants to be manifest in your life. He does, but you can hold him back if you hold back from God. Um, so in what category is he calling you to take a step? And I want to just, I'm going to give you 90 days, right? Hey, take a step, you know, and look at it. See what God does over the next 90 days. See if what I'm saying isn't true. Prove me wrong, right? Prove me that you can outgive God. You can't. So in what area do you need to do that? In what area is God speaking to you about your generosity? Maybe it's all three areas. Um, whatever it is, will you take a step? And as you do, you will be opening yourself to the manifestation of the Spirit in your life in ways you can't even imagine. I am a testimony to that. So God bless you guys. And hey, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Trust him. Trust him. God bless you guys.